Hi, this is the topic I was asked to speak on. Um, international law may sometimes seem as far away as the moon. I'll try to show it at the end that it is not that quite that distant. It's a picture. I don't have many pictures, unfortunately. It's a picture from the Whaling Convention, the Whaling Commission in 2007, just to give you a sense of what the room might look like as I'm describing the sort of thing that happens. Now, whaling is governed by the 1946 treaty, the International Convention for the Regulation of Whaling, which created a management body the, known as the IWC, or International Whaling Commission, which has met annually since 1949. Originally, in 1946, there were 12 contracting states. Um, the actual term used is contracting government. And all of these were active whaling states, including South Africa and many of the other um, countries which we now know today as firm opponents of whaling. The situation is considerably different today. There are currently 89 parties. The majority, but I would say not quite two-thirds, are generally opposed to whaling, but there's a quite significant, perhaps even 40%, um, pro-whaling lobby. The situation is far more complicated than it's ever been before because it isn't anywhere near as simple as simply pro and anti. Within each group, there are huge differences between parties and very different, diff great differences in approach. Um, Norway and Japan, for instance, are often seen as being together, but in fact their approaches are very, very different. South Africa's position, we're firmly in the anti-whaling group or lobby. We're in what's called a like-minded group. And this is what's expected by all of the other parties to be our approach. Um, we can ask whether there's some difficulty with that. Um, if we're a country that firmly adopts a sustainable use philosophy, and then we take two species, I'd say whales and seals are the two that we don't use. Um, we don't consume either, but almost anything else um, we're, we're looking to make money from and profit from. The rationale given is that we do believe in sustainable use, but we look for a non-consumptive use by promoting whale watching. Okay. A little bit of background. There has not been open fighting in recent years. The last meeting which saw dramatic fighting was 2006. From 2007 until 2010, the parties engaged in a process of reconciliation seeing if they could find common ground. The process was formally called the future of the IWC. And what the organizers of this process, which were really the governments of Japan and America, tried to do was bring together in a package form um, all of the various contentious issues and see if parties could agree to that, um, to, to various compromise deals. There would be um, a resumption of commercial whaling but it would be heavily circumscribed. It would last for a period of 10 years. Um, eventually, even some important NGOs like the WWF and Greenpeace came on board. It seemed as if this was a process that, would, um, that might get somewhere. But in, at, at the meeting in 2010, um, parties backed away from it, and the process was not, did not go forward. Which then took us a year later to the meeting in the middle of 2011. And this was a really fascinating meeting for the lawyer. The average person may not have found it so because Wales didn't really themselves get much of a look in at this meeting. Argument was all about procedure. But what I like to see, how I like to see this is that what was really happening was that it was a bitter and savage battle to decide who would control this particular body. Now, four issues dominated to the exclusion of almost anything else these were the, the four issues. Why it was that certain delegates didn't arrive, not having received visas. Whether a proposal that had been put forward by a contracting government could, at the meeting itself, be put forward by a different government. Whether to allow contracting governments to pay their annual compulsory annual subscriptions by any means other than electronic bank transfer from a bank account held in the name of a contracting government. Might sound silly, but those three issues took up the first three days of the four-day meeting. And then the fourth day was taken up in its entirety by that final issue, how to constitute a quorum. Now, I, I'm going to risk going um, over time, but I'll look at these briefly. This first issue, 
The meeting was held in Jersey, which is partly self-governing, but the United Kingdom issues visas for it. And various states argued that the United States had deliberately prevented them from obtaining visas. Um, these were pro-whaling states, and some of them didn't arrive in time. And this, uh, after endless arguments, it was decided that, that um, we would wait until some of those countries arrived before any votes were, were taken. Probably it was just a delaying tactic, and it worked very successfully as such. The second one, the United Kingdom had put forward a proposal properly. Um, that's just the rule as to putting it forward. They had done so some 60 days beforehand. Um, but at the meeting, they decided they, they backed off a little bit, didn't want to be seen as taking the step, and tried to have the, the proposal put forward by the entire European Union. That led to its own problems because the Russian commissioner objected to the European Union and said, well, you know, why not the, the, um, you know, the World Boxing Association has as much status? Um, this was the <laughs> subject. But what we got to eventually was a compromise where the United Kingdom put it forward, but it was co-sponsored by all of the other members of the European Union who were present, in, listed individually. Now, this was the actual resolution. And this was the, the clause that caused most trouble within that resolution. Now, what happened was the United Kingdom put this forward. It's a very long document. And they said, what we're trying to do is reform the IWC. We want to bring it into the 21st century. They said, the particular problem here is that the Secretariat does not want to handle enormous amounts of cash in, for, in foreign countries. So we, we they suggested that all payments need to be made as listed by EBT. And they said again and again from the floor that they couldn't understand why there would be any objection to this. It was just about modernizing. Unfortunately, at the same time, their Minister of Environment was outside briefing the media um, in terms of we are stamping out corruption within the, the IWC. We are going to prevent Japan from paying the dues of other countries, etc., etc. It didn't go down very well because, of course, many of the members, commissioners inside, you know, got, had sight of what was happening outside. And this then led to an enormous fight. But the problem was the United Kingdom just stuck by its guns because they knew they had the numbers to get this vote through. All they needed was a majority vote. So this was the, the uh, clause that they argued for and that they insisted on, on driving through. But eventually, after almost a full day of arguing, this compromise was agreed to where um, the clause went in, but if in certain circumstances governments could show that they had made the payment but it hadn't yet reached the, the bank account of the IWC, it would, um, you, you would, they would still have, be entitled to participate and to have a vote, etc. So that was the first three days. So some other business, but nothing substantive. The substantive stuff was all still to come. Now, what you need to understand is that for the last 15 years, Brazil, Argentina, and South Africa have been putting forward a proposal to create a southern, ocean, or a southern Atlantic whale sanctuary. Every year it's put forward. It would require a 75% majority vote in order to come into effect. It's never been going to get that. But every year it got a majority vote, and that was a sort of moral victory. However, the sustainable use countries objected to having this proposal put forward again because they, um, they argued that it was part of that package deal and that if we were still to try to rescue the package deal, we should not be voting on particular um, selected pieces of it. However, Argentina and Brazil in, continued to insist on putting this forward. Um, South Africa said, well, we don't think it's, it's such a good idea, and so Argentina and Brazil put the proposal forward without their usual co-sponsor, although originally it was a South African um, proposal 15 years ago. When that happened, and when the Argentinians and Brazilians insisted on putting this forward, the sustainable use group, now that's their own term for themselves, but it's largely the pro-whaling countries, walked out of the room. And what they were trying to do was break the quorum so that the meeting, no vote could be taken. I mean, they could simply have stayed in the room. 75% um, would not have been achieved, even though it was clear that there was an anti-whaling majority. But 
they decided that on the, the basis that this was destructive of the reconciliation process, they should walk out. However, once they'd done that, the anti-whaling countries argued that in fact it didn't matter because the quorum remained. And so then there became a prospect of the proposal actually being voted into place by the parties who were left, even though they were actually, there they were less parties there than, were, than half the members of the, of the commission. But you see, there were only about 61 parties out of the 88 or 87 at the time. And you had states like the United Kingdom arguing fervently, as in most of the European Union countries and most of the Latin American countries, that you determine quorum at the moment the meeting starts. If you're quorum at the start, then you remain quorum no matter how many people are in the room at any given time. Um, it doesn't sound like a great argument, but they made this very firmly. And in fact, the United Kingdom continued to make this argument for the next year. But it, it does have the, carry the logical problem that if everybody's out of the room attending the toilet or tea and one person's in the room, well, you're still quorum. In any case, sorry. Okay. We then had to debate the meaning of the word quorum. And I've just, this is from the rules of procedure, the bold words in the middle. That's all it said. Attendance by a majority of the members of the commission shall constitute a quorum. Now, this was the 63rd annual meeting of the IWC, and this had never been determined before. It never been needed to be determined before. And how do you do it? You cannot read into that conclusively which way it should, it should go. The final day saw nine hours of parties locked into private commissioners' meetings while the media and the NGOs and everybody else um, sat outside, twiddled their thumbs and waited. And so on. It was a lovely moment when the commissioner, who um, some of you may even know he's, as he's South African, um, came out of the room and he thought he'd better keep the NGOs and keep the media briefed. So he went up to the microphone and the first words he said were, I don't know who invented lawyers. Um, he's actually a scientist himself. And that, that did something to break the ice. But at the end, the compromise was taken. Certain wording was agreed to, no resolution was taken, no vote was held, but the wording would be included in the chair's report rather than being a special resolution. And the matter would then be the first matter on the agenda in 2012. That's um, South Africa's commissioner who very, very reluctantly chaired the meeting for that week only, um, Hermann Oesthuizen from Marine and Coastal Management. This year, Panama City, in June and July, and Herman refused flatly to take the floor again. Um, and in fact, then the commission from Switzerland agreed that he would chair for this meeting only. I must move quite quickly. It was considerable debate. You see, how it works is we first have a preparatory week of meetings, echoing what then happens in the plenary week. And okay. it, it became very apparent very quickly that no agreement could be reached with parties even taking the matter further back, not just back to the beginning, but even sort of beyond that, and saying that um, um, we don't even know what the words, we don't even agree on the word ongoing requirement. We think that means that um, it, it's, uh, you have to have a quorum at the start, but then thereafter anything can happen. But eventually, I think out of sheer exhaustion, parties just agreed that nobody would break a quorum for this particular meeting. Now, several votes were taken. And nobody objected to it. Nobody tried to break a quorum. These were quite interesting, some of them. This is why I'm talking about recent developments, and I will start to move away from procedure now. The, the a joint proposal put forward for an Aboriginal subsistence whaling quota by the Russian Federation, the United States, which is still a whaling country, and St. Vincent and the Grenadines as a joint proposal was very contentious because of its joint nature. Other parties didn't think that St. Vincent and the Grenadines should get this, but they eventually voted under pressure from Russia and America. But what was very interesting was that the um, Denmark, on behalf of Greenland, put forward a proposal which was, had actually which had broken agreement not to increase their quota. They asked for an increase. And they did it almost deliberately, knowing that they could have got the original quota renewed, but asking instead for a higher quota. And when that was rejected, walking away with nothing. I'll mention what, why I think that happened later on. And 
what then happened, we, a decision was taken at the meeting that the meetings will no longer be annual, but will happen every two years from now on. Now, I think that what is, been, I'm going to see these bits, I'm not going to go through any of this because um, it's I, I'm just running out of time. Okay. I think what's happening in the Whaling Commission at the moment is that the, the debates are far more sophisticated, far more complicated than they ever used to be. It isn't, to some extent, it's still about whether to kill or not to kill. But there's far more that goes into it, far more parties with different interests, etc. And although you look at these last two meetings and you think, well, they were completely bogged down in issues of process, in fact, the IWC as a whole is making really good research progress, especially. Far more is understood now than ever was understood before about whales and the different threats that whales face. These are just some of the main conservation issues that have been pushed forward in recent times, especially by the anti-whaling countries. The effects of pollution, what are meant by stinky whales are gray whales that are caught for Aboriginal subsistence whaling purposes and are then found to be smelly and inedible. And according to the Russian Federation, this affects approximately 10% of all whale, gray whales caught now. Parties are starting to look at what's happening with climate change in the oceans and how that might affect whales. What's happening with sonar? Whales have several times tried to sue the United States government and the United States military. Uh, whales, in, in fact, the world's cetacean community sued Donald Rumsfeld and George Bush at one point, arguing that the military was affecting them through its sonar. Prospecting and mining, particularly um, Sockland Island, Western Grey Whales off Russia, with shell explore, exploring and prospecting for gas in that area. Entanglements. Probably some of the people in this room deal with entanglement of whales as an issue. Perhaps one or two, I don't know. I think Kazian Wildlife would, would need to look at that within its remit. Strandings, probably the same, same story. Our understandings of how to deal with um, whale strandings and why they happen is, are improving all of the time. Um, the, um, of course, you wouldn't think so if you looked at what happened at Komaki, but it, um, we're a... A radio station put out this desperate call to everybody to go down and save whales when the pilot whale stranded. And, of course, by the time everybody responded, um, the officials were unable to, to reach the shore. But we are generally making, making progress. You, know, the, you look back into the, the late 1800s, and the, there's, there's this wonderful story by Francis Buckland, who was a, um, a naturalist at the time, who recommended that a stranded porpoise should be given a good stiff brandy and water to resuscitate it. Um, we, we have moved on somewhat. Ship strikes is another issue which um, parties are looking into quite, um, quite closely, being pr driven as an agenda by several, several countries. Whale watching is, of course, the big alternative to commercial whaling that's being put forward. Non-lethal sampling, killing methods. Some parties are arguing that killing methods should be better left to other uh, other forum, and that ship strikes should be left to the International Maritime Organization, etc. But these issues are still coming up. Small cetaceans, very contentious. Um, only 16 species of whale are managed by the IWC, and of the 85 or 86 species of whale, um, I say 85 or 86 because one may or may not be extinct, the, um, all the rest are essentially not governed in international law. From the sustainable use side, the issues that have been put forward, management procedure, I won't go into the RMP at this point, uh, Japanese small type coastal whaling and whether it should be treated the same as Aboriginal subsistence whaling, a conflict between particularly Sea Shepherd and Greenpeace and Japanese research vessels in the Southern Ocean, trade, uh, three countries which are engaging in scientific permit whaling, or uh, let's say two and one that wants to, one of the important issues at the moment is international litigation because at the moment there is a case being heard by the International Court of Justice. Australia has taken Japan to the ICJ alleging that Japan is in breach of three separate conventions by issuing scientific permits uh, for whale research. At present, the papers on each side have been filed and the ICJ is deliberating. We haven't yet seen the papers. They'll only be released after a judgment has been concluded. 
Some people are arguing that this is very important and this has the potential to change everything. It doesn't seem likely. Given what we know of this and how the composition of the ICJ judges are made up, um, where parties to matters even get to select a judge for themselves, it's highly unlikely that we're going to see anything dramatic happen. Something else dramatic that did happen in Panama in the middle of this year, though, which is that South Korea popped up unexpectedly and said that they were now going to or were preparing to um, issue permits for scientific permit whaling. Um, privately, they told some of us that, in fact, they are just so frustrated after 20 years of no movement on the, we call it a moratorium, but it's actually a zero quota, but uh, no movement on that. They're, they're now looking to, to resume whaling. And announcing this against the backdrop of the ICJ case was, I think, a deliberate slap in Australia's face. Directions, um, what's happening, as I say, the arguments are becoming far more complicated. They're still presented in the media and by NGOs as being relatively simple. And I think that's inevitable. You can't in the media, in the, the mainstream media, explain the complexity of many of these debates. And for an NGO on, on either side of the perspective, pro or anti, um, it's, you, you want a stark message that will raise funds. Whales are endangered, whales are in money, whales are not endangered, etc. I think in 2011, the anti-whaling side did its best to take a firm grip on control of the IWC, and largely it did that. But in 2012, there was a definite turnaround. Um, there was actually a rather nasty split within the ranks of the anti-whaling sides through Denmark and Greenland, and the probability that Greenland deliberately provoked the, the fight in order to give them a reason to leave the IWC completely. Um, I'm on my last, last two slides. That's it. I'm saying what I think is happening at the moment is that what we're seeing is a savage but low-key battle for control. Is it important? Is it important that many of these battles are being fought out through procedural issues? At international level, and even to some extent at national level, it's very difficult to separate substantive issues and procedural issues. And in order to be a successful negotiator, you need to understand both. Last slide. I just wanted to say that this may seem very far away for the person involved in with national conservation issues. Um, but I think it isn't. And I think one of the, the main reasons is that whaling is so high profile an issue, probably even the highest profile conservation issue of all. And it has what happens in the whaling arena has the potential to affect all conservation in every country. What we're really doing is fighting about how we are going to have a relationship with nature in the future. That's it. Thank you very much, uh, Prof, uh, for the presentation. I will now invite questions. Can I also just give uh, two can I look at, oops, can I look this side? I haven't uh, received a question from this side. Okay, I see one hand, the gentleman in front. Is there somebody who wants to ask? Okay, thank you. Hi, Prof. Um, can you just expand a bit on the, the, the term scientific um, permit whaling? Uh, and is it still a thinly veiled kind of expression of just okay. wanting to, to, to sure. embark on whaling? Very, very difficult to know, but... Um, it, and ultimately, there is nobody who can make that decision. The ICJ make, might make a decision, but there is, you see, this being an old convention, it does not contain any provision for an arbiter or a dispute resolution body within it. So there's nothing within the convention itself that can make a decision on whether there is an abuse or whether it's, it's legal or not. What happened is that when the treaty was originally signed, created, it's a treaty and it then has a schedule attached to it. In that schedule, at the instance of a Norwegian delegate, um, an exception was put in place by which a country could, an, an, a contracting government, could issue a permit to its own nationals to take whales for scientific research. It probably was never intended that that would be anything more than a mere handful of whales. And it didn't cause any trouble for a long time. 
In 1982, a moratorium, a zero quota was voted into place. That kicked in from the 85, 86 seasons. Now, Norway objected to, the, to that zero quota and is not bound by it. Japan objected, but then withdrew their objection and almost immediately began, instead of taking whales commercially, began to take whales in their thousands for scientific research purposes. Now, the arguments from this point go back and forth. It's certainly legal in terms of the convention and its schedule to take whales for scientific permit reasons, or for scientific research. Um, whether there's an abuse or not is going to depend on the purpose to which they're put and the, um, the, uh, the, the, the numbers taken, etc. The arguments, again, go back and forth. Opponents say that, well, Japan clearly started this only in response to having lost their, their commercial quota. Um, Japan says, well, you know, we, we're actually doing this because it's necessary to research and look at what we've learned from it. Opponents say, well, um, all of the meat is, ends up in restaurants. Japan says, well, we're required in terms of the, the clause in the schedule not to waste that meat, so we have to do it. Um, the, the arguments go, you know, Japan is subsidizing this. Japan's response is, but we do it very inefficiently. We go down to the ocean. We don't just go down and take whales. We go down, we take samples of whales from this area. We sail to that area. We take another sample represent, representative of age, sex, etc. So they say we, it's very expensive the way we do it. Um, and we, we just go back and forth, back and forth like a game of ping pong. Um, at this point, you can only say that it's an abuse if you say that Japan is taking more than it needs but um, uh, there's no official arbiter who can make that decision. Okay. Uh, thanks. I will, I will take the last question. Um, I think I'm obliged to take this one from Dai. What I'd like to know is, is anybody in South Africa who's monitored the effect of whales, or all the possibility of tapping off the East Coast at the moment? Currently, we have, uh, I'm aware of, four EIAs in process for prospecting off our east coast. And who is actually, who is in authority to check that this is not having an effect on our whales? Okay, I can answer the second part of your question, but not the first. Um, I don't know what marine and coastal management is doing about it. Um, I truly don't. Um, it's not an issue I've dealt with. Um, I understand that I'm not a, um, although I've, I've joined the Cyprian delegation to a number of these, these meetings, I'm not in government, I'm at a university, and I've not explored this particular issue, so I can't comment on that. I can comment on the second part of the question, which is that marine and coastal management within the Department of Environmental Affairs is responsible for um, whaling issues and, and for whales. Um, this is, of course, a different issue from what I've, I've presented on, because what we're talking about here is a national management issue rather than, than the international question. Um, I think you need, you're going to need to contact Marine and Coastal Management, and, um, but let's have a chat afterwards and we can um, talk about who you should contact. Okay. Okay.